presentation. So uh, this is my friend to introduce John Kessel. For the people that were at the symposium last year, got to hear John speak. Um, obviously, uh, that's what I'm sure John is a presenter. I'm going to talk to him last year. But I'm back. John's the director of sports development with uh, USA Volleyball. Um, does lots of grassroots stuff. And I uh, love listening to him talk. Uh, one of the
Maybe it's because we don't play enough as kids. You know, that certainly is a change. We're probably really good with our thumbs, and we're not nearly as good with our feet. So I'm going to share a website. It's in my blog recently, but it's called Design to Move. Dot order. And for me, as a as a teacher, um, there's a pretty powerful statement in that about motor learning, and that is that in, at least in my country. This is the first generation that the kids are going to die five years younger than we do. And that sucks. Now, the research also has been beautifully done by Nike in collaboration with Reebok and Asics and other companies because this is very important to get us as leaders to get kids to be moving. We don't care if they're moving in volume. We just care that they're moving. Or 10, because the window of opportunity they're the same in the research that they've done is that if you get kids reacting up till 10, then they're going to be active for the rest of their life. If you introduce it to them after, the activity afterlife starts to drop off dramatically. And that's maybe because we don't do as much recess in the United States and probably here as we used to do variations on the same. Everything's so trying to train and controlled by coaches. So if you come down to the Seattle ACCA Final Four, Karch gave Karai, who's our now our women's national team coach, but a very great indoor player, uh, three gold medals, two, feet, two indoor, one beach in the Olympics. Um, Karch spoke about how often he broke into the gyms in Santa Barbara to just play doubles with his friends. Not six on six, unless they had more kids. But they were always apologizing to the security guard or coming up with excuses on how they got in there, you know. But he says, we just want to play. And that's what the Brazilians do, and that's what we need to do. So if there's a term that I want to walk away from here with, in addition to player recovery, is that we want to create a better, a culture of play. And in my country, you put up this beautiful thing and you get the kids and they don't go on to the court and go what? Because you're supposed to go on the court. And that we gotta we gotta work to convince them that as long as I'm in the gym, come in and start the play. So one of the other very important things is my give some feedback. How many of you are hearing me for the first time? Just raise your hand. I just look at that. All right. So one of the really important principles in more learning is you've got to change in volleyball is to teach positive first as we go to be perfect. Okay? So we've got to go from positive to perfection. Because it's my belief in the research I see over the 45 years. Anybody know if you type in the word volleyball drill and you Google how many hits you get? 3,800,000. Motor learning is going to let you pick the exercises that will transfer best and teach them quicker because there's a pretty powerful phrase by Norman Schmidt. He asks all the time, are you, are you practicing for practice or are you practicing for performance? And that's a pretty powerful phrase in my opinion. Because in working with 38 different sports, they kept doing things drill-wise that were traditional in any of the sports, not just football, because we had 38 Olympic sports there when he was speaking about motor learning. And he kept saying, 
You're practicing for practice. You're not practicing for performance. What does that mean? It means several things. One, we know this to be true in more than one. That random training, random, is superior to block. That the chaos of just doing a tag thing, the retention of what is learned by doing it chaotically and random, is almost ten times better than if you do it in the way I taught in the 70s, block. Where I threw the ball in the same spot over and over and over and over again. And we look good in And then we go suck in performance. Random training is vastly superior for retention. So that's why I had to get comfortable with the ugliness and the imperfection of chaos that comes with the play. Instead of, we look at now, we're about ready in March or April. We're going to put up two new drills. And there's some really good things that are coming out. Um, everybody here, her club, copy all you want, knowing though that this is an 8.5 dual layer uh, DVD, not one of those hundreds in a stack where you get them for 20 bucks and you think, and you get DVDs, it's just this is a dual layer DVD, so you got to pay more money to buy the, the dual layers to make copies. But everybody will get that, as per club and the larger clubs are getting two or three. Um, I want you to see something else. I had to ask for it, it was already over there, and I just laid out my next talk to the intermediate group on it, but since you're a teacher, it boggles my brain how many of you fail to use a whiteboard. Even though you walk into any classroom on the planet Earth and the whiteboard is there called the chalkboard and you start to write your lesson plans or you put things on it and you're a teacher in the classroom. You guys, this is our classroom and if this is your classroom, you got to have a whiteboard. I, it, ah! <laughs> so, I could, so I wrote a blog called Where is Your Whiteboard? And in that, if you go look at it, you'll see all the ways, including paint, whiteboard paint exists. Uh, go to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, at least here in, you know, at least in my country, and you get these nice mica boards for like $15 that are four by eight. You don't have to spend this kind of money, but you got to have a whiteboard, because you're a teacher for God's sakes. You're not a, just a coach. And every teacher knows it, and we walk in the gym, and it's like, oh, I forgot about that part. So I'm going to show you a couple of the drills that are on or the DVD, because they speak kind of volumes to, um, to what we're attempting to do. Okay. So here's the first one, and know that, you know, I hope if I repeat this because I cross paths with you, this is just so important. It's one of the most mind blowing things for me. Everybody knows Queen of the Court. And if you don't, just talk to the person next to you and they'll tell you what it is. Every last time I checked, great motor learning science says you must train with the things that are game-like. They are called regulatory stimuli. They regulate how you do things. Because in the end, this is about what we see that determines how good I'm going to be. 
And the last time I checked, every third hit on the planet Earth in every game ever played has to go over a seven foot four barrier. Every third hit. And every first hit comes over it as well. So here's one of the dumb things I did for about 20 years as a young coach. <laughs> I wish I had those kids back. I, I didn't understand how important serving and serve receive is. I'm going to say this very clearly. You can never serve and serve receive enough. You think you have, but you haven't. Why did the US team lose to Brazil in the London Olympics? We didn't win the serve, serve, receive battle. Brazil did. We lost. If you coach 13s, you know that a kid can just serve you off the court. It has nothing to do with your hitting and your digging and your reading. I mean, yeah, it has nothing to do with your reading, but it has nothing to do with all these other skills you might be teaching. You can't win the serve, serve, receive battle. You must win that first. But it also works at the Olympic level. So if serve and serve receive is so important, and everybody's here going, yes, I've been training game like, I've got my level one manual, and I've been training game like, yes, I'm training game like. If that's the case, last time I checked, what skill starts every point ever scored in 99.999% of your games? Serve. The serve starts every skill and every point. How many of your drills are that game-like? And I'm just going to say again, not enough. It's not like you've got to do 100% because I think you have to, you know, we know we've got to teach pieces sometimes. But I do know this as a concept from motor learning, which is about opportunities to respond. In the end, we're about the more touches you get in the same amount of time, the better you get. Therefore, I take a ribbon, and we'll, you know, do this other time, but I take the cell, I just bought this over the Christmas holidays for $7.99, it's 50, yard, 50 yards long, and I string it from there all the way down to there, and for 45 minutes of my practice, they play over the top of the net, which is the, the, what I think it looks almost the same. Yeah, maybe it's a tiny bit thinner, but the kids don't care. And the kids learn to hit every first ball over and every third ball over because that's game-like. And what, to the ones that haven't heard me, what makes me cry is that Ross spends 30 minutes setting this thing up and then the kids come in and they partner pass. And it's in your level one manual, about 20 pages of pair drills. Now, I'm going to write another thing I think that's really important. I'm going to even do it in black. Everything I'm doing here, I am giving you information, not criticism. If I'm criticizing anyone, it's why I didn't figure this out sooner. <laughs> but now I know, and my kids win a lot. But in that spirit, if you meet a team that is really good like you are, this we know. One of you is going to lose, which means 50% of you are going to lose. So if you world travel through this sport based on outcome, you're going to be in pain a lot because half the teams lose every time you meet head to head. So, sorry, so can you just take the pairs and just put them over the net? You can, but let's look at this positive to perfect. So if you'll come down, if you would. That's what happens when you ask a question. <laughs> So what you, uh, we're, we'll do it in front of here. It'll be kind of tight, but this is a space right here, okay? What you can't do is this. Some variation of this. You can't do this. We've got to do that, that, and then that in some way. 
let me, thanks. So the first one is what I see most teams do. In that motor learning program, in that habit that you're teaching an athlete, they are learning to put it straight back to where it came from. And that's the negative error. But, ladies and gentlemen, in Canada and in the US, it wins at the Why does it win at the beginning level? We are the only sport, other than soccer, and I can explain why in soccer, but we're the only sport that the worst team wins at the beginning level. In every other sport, the worst team loses. But you are saying, because you're leaders in volleyball, three hits. And that means chance to dork one, chance to dork two, and, all, and, and you've got to be kind of precise to the setter and then hit it over the net. And what are they doing? They just hit it any way they can, anywhere over the net, and they will beat you for about three or four months. That's unusual in sport. But that's process over outcome. So when I get good at pairs, I get good at putting it straight back to where it came from. Anybody here in a setter in this group? All right, I'll be the setter for the group. I know this to be true as a setter. I stand here to the right of center and I wave my hand and I say, over here, over here, over here. And the ball gets ripped down the line to zones four and five. Where is the ball being passed? <laughs> Not to me. In front of me somewhere. And I have to move forward as they pair pass it straight. And then we add insult to injury and we let kids do this. For uh, on the guise of ball control. If I become the Olympic gold medalist at wall passing, <laughs> and then I go to serve receive, where will I put the ball? Straight back to where it came from. That's what I'm learning in wall passing. So some of you are going, shit, what do I do? <laughs> and the answer is here. I'll get down to it. I think it's under U. Yeah. So here's some 13, no, 11 year olds, 11 and a 10. You can tell me who the 10 year old is, easy. Um, and these are on your DVD. Come on. I thought I double clicked it. Uh -uh. Maybe not. There we go. I probably have it 10 times now. This is what we want kids to do when they walk in the gym. What did I do? Slide? Oh, that's later. Sorry. I want this one. <laughs> I screwed up twice. Imagine 11-year-olds who only know this skill. Three hits, self, set, and hit it over the stripe on the third hit. Pass it to myself, set it to myself, and hit it over the stripe on the third hit. And if you haven't picked up on this, they are also not hitting where they're looking, which is a higher level. This is not just beginners. These kids are purposely hitting cut shots and hitting line shots because they were told to not hit the way they're facing. John, in the beginning, because obviously those girls have skills, even though they're little, they're young. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, when you first introduce it to that age, can they even do? Like, well, like yeah, they can. They would do something like this. In my gym is this seven foot four duct tape around the gym. And over here, this is what I did as a young coach, teaching wrist snap, which is a myth. There's no such thing as wrist snap that provides spin. <laughs> Holy mother of God, some of you are 
me right now. Because I'm in a Catholic school, right? <laughs> Can a golf club impart remarkable spin on a ball? I know how good I slice. So I can tell you it can put amazing spin on a ball. Since it can, does a golf club ever snap? No. When I say the myth of wrist snap, it's because in the science of what is happening when the ball is being hit, the contact time in a spike is around a hundredth of a second of contact time. And in super slow motion, you see the wrist go back for two thousandth of a second, backwards, and then you see it move forward for the next six thousandth of a second, and then it's no longer being touched. And for all intents and purposes, it's like a golf club. How do you put spin on the ball? Where you hit the sphere, just like a golf cl club. And whether you hit, how you hit through the sphere. That's what we've got to teach, not wrist snap. But the thing that the kids are showing you is that every third hit, even when they're little tiny kids, has to clear the net. So this is what I do as a five-year-old, something like this. Because I'm learning that the first ball that comes to me Perfect would be to the setter, but which on a team of six or a team of two is the positive error? Back to where it came from or straight up? Straight up. It's an error, but it's a good one. I got a teammate or five other teammates that are there. It loses at the beginning, though, because when we put it up, my next teammate dorks the next one, and the other team wins the point again. So every time we do three hits, we lose to these teams that are just going brrrr. And then you break through, finally. And you never lose to them again, because you have real ball control, not artificial. So one of my banners says, use of the court without use of the net is prohibited. And that's what's happening here. So you've come down, and we go over the net, but we don't go brrrr, we go self. Set, and you can just go self and over if you want. I'm okay with that if you want to get down to two contacts. But I like setting and then hitting off of my own set until I get to doubles. And then I'm going to pass to you, you're going to set me, and I'm going to hit it over. Now, is this important at the highest level? Yeah, I'm going to tell you about two guys that have a gold medal. I don't have a gold medal, but Rick Lamborn and uh, Riley Sammons have a gold medal from Beijing. And for nine years, they warmed up by playing one-on-one. -on -one. They never warmed up by running, stretching, jogging. They played one-on-one. -on -one. I think they said the score is something like 4,522 to 4,300 or something. But they played one-on-one -on -one as their warm-up. That's what little kids can do, even if it's just slap, slap, ugh. all of a sudden they're figuring out as they play on a shorter court. And that when you put the ribbon up, of course, you've got all these short courts. So this is about motor learning. So we need to, I'm going to show you this other one that just is really, really cool. It's just a piece of it. Um, Oops, sorry. So, guy, what am I doing wrong? There. So this is one of those mind shifts for me. BC will start to defeat more, because I know you guys win a lot, everybody else, if you can create a culture of play at the schools where what they do is play monkey in the middle, if you want to call it that, but loser becomes the net. <laughs> queen of the court. It's still queen of the court. But instead of losing and waiting, you become the net because there's no net at recess. There's no net when you only have this side of the court and you've got to play on this side because the other team has that side. So you play one-on-one, -on -one, loser becomes the net. 
And that's a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a national team player. Can the net jump? No. But can the net be aggressive? Yeah, because is it positive to set the ball too close or too far off? Which is the good error? Too far off. So when they make the negative error and set it too close, you should be able to block it with a live net of loser becomes the net volleyball. Yeah, he's, he's getting frustrated because he's been in the middle so much, he starts to jump. <laughs> and he moves back and forth and <laughs> stuff, okay? So that one shift to say to kids that love, the, you only need two other friends that love the game, you just need a ball, you don't even need a friggin' net. And you start scoring in these games of one-on-one -on -one over the net that's a human net. And I don't know, it's like about 10 years ago we came up with this and every time people go, oh. <laughs> it's like, but this is what we do, we play over the net. So this is, I'm sorry? Is that on the blog? Yeah. And it's uh, actually on the uh, video and... Uh, it, we call it one-on-one, -on -one. loser becomes a net. You really do. Yeah. <laughs> when kids watch it, they say, oh, that's monkey in the middle. Pig in the middle, we call it. Pig in the middle, yeah, okay. So you guys got a lot of bacon up here. <laughs> can you, the, the, the drill video shows it two on two, because you can do it to a six. It, uh, we did it up with Kerry Walsh and doubles in Aspen. We did it in a, where was I, Cheyenne, Wyoming, on a parking lot, you know, on asphalt, and they just played two-on-two two with no net, but they just played, waiting to get into the gym before their chance to play again or whatever. Because imagine a year, kids with years of motor skill where every third hit goes over the net, not into the net. Into the net is negative. Why is it so incredibly important to hit over the net? It's not just because of the traditional reasons that we think of. It's because in practice, when you serve out and hit out, you teach your team what out is. And that's a really important skill. A few years ago, the NC2A championships were lost by a middle back who kept playing out balls. And all the coaches sitting on the end line are going, it's out, and the player would play the ball. It wasn't touched, it, they just didn't know where out was. And they played these out balls. And out isn't determined as it flies by, out's determined way out there as it tracks in, okay? So I'm gonna go back to this, you can't serve and serve receive enough, motor learning principle. Dumb John, for 12, maybe 15 years, maybe three quarters of a million kids, <laughs> I blew the whistle, boop, said go serve. And the kids would serve. The kids would serve for sometimes 10 minutes under the old blocked format. They'd, they'd serve until their brains were fried and they had no rem memory of what was going on. Then I went game-like. Game-like, this time together, game-like, think BC volleyball reality, how many serves do you serve at your level before you lose the serve? On average, mm -hmm. two. probably two. Like me. How many rotations until they serve again? It's not six, it's 12. Because the other team gets their three chances to screw up in every rotation before you get a serve. And that takes around eight, six minutes. So in game-like training, like we're teaching the Oklahoma Thunder in basketball at the NBA, because basketball's all screwed up too. <laughs> game-like training is I need to be able to collect my thoughts, be aggressive and serve three times and then do other volleyball things for around six to maybe ten minutes and then be able to go back to the end line and serve three times and never miss. 
That's how they learn to serve in the game. That's how the game is played. So we need to do more of that training. But what did John do? And I'm okay with one or two minutes of serving. I'm just not okay with what I used to do, a hundred serves or ten minutes of serving. That is a waste of time. It's better to do five two minutes by far than one ten minute. I'm still doing ten, but I got to break it up more game-like. So what did I do for those two minutes even? I'm going to say, like I said, three quarters of a million serves were served, and how many of them got serve received? None. What an idiot I was. Three quarters of a million serves, and nobody served received a single one of them. Okay. Since you got to win the serve, serve, receive battle, what do I do now when I go, ah, serve? <laughs> One on each side covers the whole court and attempts to serve receive the ball to the imaginary target. They know where it's supposed to go. And somebody is serve receiving. It's not the libero, it's everybody. Because everybody's got to get good at serve receiving. They cover the whole court in those two minutes or one minute or whatever. And now I'm a lot happier as a coach because my team serve receives better. To those of you that heard this last year, Bear with me, but I think it's pretty important to understand. The two most important skills in our sport are not forearm passing and serving. The two most important skills in our sport are reading and learning. Learning. Now here's what we know about motor science learning. Extrinsic learning is the worst retained the least effectively remembered for performance. What is extrinsic learning? Where I tell you what to do. That's what I did for years. I was the coach. I'm the teacher. I would say, put your right foot forward. And then I learned about motor learning. I went, oh, that's not an effective way to remember and retain. So what do we do now? Any ideas? Ask them. Ask them. Asking them is Socratic questioning. Peer evaluation. Peer evaluation is wonderful with questions rather than telling. Let them do it. Actually. Let them do it. And here's the two magical words that may help you when you leave here. Guided discovery. See, and it's one of the slides in the presentation, but the best teachers are the ones that tell you where to look, but not what to see. You guide their discovery. Which foot should be forward? Well, I don't know. Well, what happens if you put your right foot forward? What happens now if you put your left foot forward? And you guide them. You give them hints, 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 but never the rule. You know the rule. Don't give them the rule. Give them hints and guide them to go, well, then I should put my right foot forward. Yeah, that's it, you know? And you walk away. Because that is retained almost as good as implicit learning. Implicit learning is where you figure it out yourself. And that's always the best remembered. But it can take a while. It can take a while. So what do we got to do with implicit learning? Guide their discovery to that aha moments and variations on a thing. All right. Questions so far? And reading? You said two most important skills. One was learning and then reading. And reading. So you know that reading is the most important skill because if you sat here on the team bench on this court during a match and the opposing team tipped, you could get up and walk out at this speed and save the stupid ball. <laughs> and the team all goes, ah, oh, shit, what do we do, coach? <laughs> but here's what I did as a coach teaching the way I was taught for about 12 years. Ross, get on that back line. Damn it. I'm so pissed you can't get that ball. All right? Ready? Go get that ball. Hit. Go get that ball. Hit. 
And maybe we are figure eighting and the rest of the team is going, go Ross, go, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> You've got to train in reality. What I just taught Ross is that balls that he has to learn to get are going to come over the net, drop down about waist height, and they're going to shoot out in the corner. Yeah, that's what they do. They shoot out, and they shoot out in the corner like this sometimes. God, no wonder they couldn't save a ball. Because I sat there and went like this. How many balls have they seen thrown to them? And it's kind of, if you can be my setter for a second. Last year, we, you probably saw this, so here's my setter. This is what we call the middle hitter dance, okay? I want a quick set, right? Low, low. <laughs> Da, 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 da. You know? <laughs> After this course, I will pray when I leave your country that none of you ever throw the ball to the setter again. Because you're stealing reading from the setter and you're stealing reality and passing skills from the middle hitter who in practice, because you're practicing non-game like, looks good and then when they go play they're late. Well, they're not even the play because they can't handle the ball and get up. They can throw the ball and get up but they can't do reality handle and then get and be there on time. Whose fault? Mine. Not the kids. Not the kids. Okay, I was told we get till 15 after and then we get a, um, oh, we don't, can't hear that one, darn it. Ah, we're going to go for it. I'm going to get a speaker really quickly here, so hang on. Okay, so what is the most important skill in volleyball? I said reading and anticipation, and so we're going to promote it one more time while I get my speaker and stuff. So talk to me about technique. I know two things. My kids now know that they can chess save a ball. They never realized that they could. But the biggest thing is, is that what they're showing here is really good reading to get to the ball before it hits the spot. Very good. There's a negative error into the net. Okay, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to make it loud enough so you guys can hear this guy with this. Oops, unless I'm doing the wrong way. I was. Okay, I only need one. Plenty of thoughts go through a player's mind during the final round that can impact whether they're hitting on all cylinders. Let's head to the practice the archives now. It's a tip on what goes through the mind of a pro and how to look like you're in the zone. Even when you might not be. I've been asked many times. I don't care about the changes. What are your swing thoughts as you're swinging? What is, you know, what are what are the secrets? What are the secrets of golf? Can you hear? Well, I heard this one. Write this down, it really helps. What I try to do, I try to flat load my feet. 
speed, so I snap load my power package. That way I can amplify both lag and drag pressure through that fix. As long as my number two power accumulator doesn't break down, I can reach maximum centrifugal force with minimum pivotal resistance. You see, the pivot is the utilization of multiple centers to reduce the circular motion that generates a triple force on our system plane, plus the piece of glass in that area for two line delivery pack. See, golf is geometrically oriented linear force. It involves a physical muscular thrust and a geometry of the circle. You can divide the golf swing into 24 basic components, each having between 12 and 15 variations. Now, when you think of all this, and you get it all set, hopefully you'll hit shots like this. <laughs> so we know in motor learning, that the more you know, the more you try and tell them, the more you confuse them. And that's something we've got to get away from. And I'm going to go to, well, I'll use this slide as an example. What do you tell a five-time Olympian gold and bronze medalist if you see her do that in your gym or on your court. What do you tell her? Well played. <laughs> I don't know, are these guys loonies or something or what are they called? I, don't know. I was going to give a loony or whatever. Way to keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> but this is the example of a perfect technique, error in judgment not technique. And this happens even with eight-year-olds. Because I can get an eight-year-old to show you how to spike. So we're going to test this August group here. I want you to reach as high as you can. Hitting arm up. This is a nice chance to stretch. So hitting arm up. So you're reaching as high as you can. Okay. And now reach higher. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I'm very specific. I say reach as high as you can. And then when I say reach higher, everybody goes, oh, higher. Oh. <laughs> well, we all know that this is where we should hit. And then time and time again, kids hit here. And for 12 years until I got into motor learning, I babbled about technique. And I said to these kids hitting it here, reach, extend, get on top of the ball, keep your elbow up. Don't drop your elbow, I said when I was really negative. And I was wrong. Not because they are not technically correct statements, but because if they did that, listening to me, they would reach, hit the ball off their elbow, and could look at me and say, happy? <laughs> I reached. Why are they hitting the ball here? They're timing. They're timing. That's where the ball is. So how do you get them to hit the ball there? They got to go sooner. They got to go faster. They probably need to do both. And if they go sooner and faster, where will the ball be? It hasn't fallen as far, and all the technical people are now happy. That's what's happening here. This gal doesn't need to be told a pip about technique. Even look at her platform. It's beautiful. She got a floater serve in the wind, I'm sure, and variations on a theme, and she just misread the ball. You go, next ball. That's, it's part of variance. It just happens. All right. Um, so I'm going to go down to some readable things that are a little bit heavy, but we need to uh, see them. Uh, okay. All right. So, motor learning is a very well-established science. We know to be, this to be true, that whole training is superior to part. 
and part should only be done on an individual basis as short amount of time until they understand what the part problem is and then get back to the whole. Because when you do part or progressions, you are practicing for practice and not for what they're going to have to do in the game, which is perform and play whole. They don't get to do a part in any game that they ever play. So the faster you get out of a progression, done individually, not to the whole group. I remember in camps in the 70s, we would all practice spiking. We'd hold hands in like some damn Rockettes line, and we'd go right, left, right, left. And we'd walk around and hold hands, and the whole group was leaping. <laughs> God, I slowed their learning down instead of watching every kid hit and going, you need to come talk to me about your footwork because you're finishing left, right, but everybody else is finishing right, left, and there you go back to hitting. I individually talk about pieces that are problems, not make everybody do the same thing when they're already doing it right. But I was teaching the way I was taught. So, Inexperienced coaches training nov novice players where the instructors become frustrated by the performance variability. That word variability is almost as important as retention. And just as an aside, I hope sometime this spring to have two drills that we're going to create in film that we're going to call AD1 and AD2. Because I know some of you have athletic directors that if you're playing and in this chaos and it's looking ugly and it's like you're, you know, you're screaming and yelling, you're pulling them out one-on-one, -on -one, but you're not drilling them, the ADs are going to go, hey, what's going on here? I'm a football coach. You should be doing drills. So when the AD comes in, you'll just yell, 81! And then the kids all start to do 81 drill. <laughs> And he'll be really happy, and it'll be fairly game-like, because really one of the best AD drills is butterfly. <laughs> Think about it. Start practice at four and do the butterfly, rather than start practice at four and run and jog and stretch and bullshit like that. Because in butterfly, in about seven or six minutes, they've run. And if you want them to go from there down to here and do some sort of slide step, you can do that. And crossover step, you can do all sorts of fun things as they run to the next position if you want. But they're learning to read balls coming over the net. And again, apologies to those of you, you, me, those of you that heard me last time, but this is just too important. Because I even got to ask Carrie Walsh the same question this last summer. So I've asked Kerry Walsh, Misty May, and every men and women's Olympic team libero since 96 the same question. What percent of your success at serve receiving, not passing, serve receiving the ball to my teammate, AKA setter if it's a six on six, <laughs> happens before the ball breaks the plane of the net? And Carrie said the same thing as Misty, as well as every libero. 80%. You got to win the serve, serve, receive battle. 80% of it is done before the ball even breaks the plane in the net. And my kids partner pass. Why am I wasting time partner passing? When I have a net. I have a net. Because of tradition. That's all I'm going to tell you. I did it for around 12, 10 years teaching the way I was taught until the science went, this is not effective. You can be the world's best at partner passing and you are the world's best at putting it straight back to where it came from. Not a skill I want my kids to know even at <coughs> five or six. So because of that, in passing they have a lot of variables and as they get better they're error cone gets tighter and smaller because of accuracy, but they still have variability. I um, was researching something on hammering a nail, and when you track the head of a hammer 
as you nail, in a thousand hammerings, you do a thousand different spots on the head of the nail, or I mean, the head of the hammer. It, it's still variable, even though it's the circle of that little head, it still varies. So variability happens. And when it does, chillax, you know, just, it's okay. And if, they, if you play poorly because of it, life goes on. Because one of my favorite blogs that I share, and it's on, it's on the uh, CD, is called Stats for Parents and Players. And that simply attempts to help every parent understand that your darling son or daughter is going to spend 50% of her time playing below her average. Half the time, half the time in every tournament, she's going to play below her average. And you don't need to go get private lessons when they do or freak out. You just keep playing and learning by playing. And then they get better. So instructors get frustrated by this variability and lack of successful reps of new learners. As a consequence, these inexperienced coaches limit or abandon whole teaching for part and stop doing random training and do blocked. Unfortunately, this course of action deprives the learners of the environmental variability, environmental variability, reality, training and reality, and sensory inputs that are essential to the formation of motor maps and implicit, there's that in a word again, implicit behaviors, which are ultimately, ultimately reflecting the acquisition of mo functional motor skills and expert performances. In total, the evidence on this topic is clear. Drawing distinctions between training methods based on age or ability is a coaching practice that has no foundation in either motor learning science or the application of motor learning principles. We have a 13-year-old girl who is AVP. Do I put her in the uh, LTAD pipeline and say, okay, little 13 year old, it's now time to train to sneeze or whatever the pipeline says or something, you know? No. She's already at the 20 year old, she's beating 20 year olds. Why? Because when she was seven, she started to play volleyball, doubles. And by the time she got to be 13 against adults, she's pretty damn good. Triple A. So that's important. Um, <laughs> specialization is for insects. Do you guys know, the new groups for sure, in Brazil at the 14 and under level you must play a 6-6 six, six at nationals. You can't play a 5-1. You can't play a 6-2. You can't play even a 6-3, which is what I like to do with 14 year olds. You must play against the other teams who must also play a 6-6. Six, six. No, they're 13. Who God knows what they can be as a setter or a middle blocker yet. But we go to win and we start running 5-1s with 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds. Hey, you got to know your philosophy. My philosophy is feed the My other philosophy is Never be a child's last coach. <laughs> so that is why when I gave my Hall of Fame induction speech down in Seattle last month, I said, I looked at Chuck Irby's record of 931 and 322 or whatever and looked at the other coach getting inducted and I went, gosh, I don't know, you guys, my record isn't on my handout here, so I'll just let you know. It's, it's 10,322 and 31. And everybody went, what? I said, yeah, I lost 31 kids over the course of my coaching that after I coached them, they quit volleyball. And that ripped me up. It still does. To see a kid I coach bail on volleyball the next year. I didn't do my job. All right? So specializations for insects. Um, This is a question based on motor learning in no small part. As you train your kids, you need to know what their goals are. Not your goals, their goals. And maybe they don't match up to you, and so we can work on some things there. So here's another thing about motor learning. 
This stuff has been proven in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s. There's not much being newly developed other than they're trying to figure out why random is better than blocked and they're, yeah, they're working on, anybody getting their degree in this stuff, they're working on a few other areas, but. So, in a surgeon, and being a surgeon is way more important than being a volleyball coach because you're dealing with people's lives, he notes, we have not effectively used the ability science has already given us and we have not made remotely adequate efforts to change that. When we've made a science of performance, thousands of lives have been saved. That's in motor learning of surgery. It's another motor learning thing. And we don't do it well. So the, here, here's a new one that none of you have heard. You might hear it again in the keynote, but if you're an intern as a doctor, does anybody know one of the principles that they teach you? Is anybody a doctor here or anything cool like that? They say, see one, do one, teach one. So one of my challenges to you guys that I said last year, I'll say again, how much are your little kids being coached by little kids too? Two, three years older than them. Not 18s coaching 13s, but 13s coaching eight-year-olds. And getting your pipeline started earlier because that which you teach you learn, and that's pretty cool. So if there's a red flashing, I'll put it up in black again, thing that we want to be thinking about, it's specificity. I don't know if there's any more important principle in motor learning than that. Training is specific. Training effects are in the main so specific that even minor departures from movement forms, velocities, and intensities result in undesirable training effects and maybe even have negative effect. How do you learn to jump higher? You spike approach and jump higher more. Now, I'm going to tell you a little science that we did because there's a product out there called the jump shoe. <laughs> And I think it sells for about a couple hundred bucks. And so we're going, hey, national team wants to jump higher. We're going to study the jump shoe. And I'll tell you what we found. That the people who spent 200 bucks on jump shoes jumped more than they used to. <laughs> but if you did the same amount of jumping without the jump shoe, you even jumped higher. And so we don't use the jump shoes. The only reason they were getting wonderful increases in their vertical jump was because they were finally jumping. <laughs> but specificity is so specific that jumping with jump shoes didn't get as high as jumping with the shoes that you jump in. That's how specific training is. So that's pretty important, we think. So John, okay. Would that negate the idea of then having them doing skipping to improve their vertical? You would say just doing skipping? Yeah. I mean, again, specific. part of what it is, I'm going to throw this out, that's a great question. There's homework and there's fun and there's I've got a net and a team of 12 and oh my god, let's exactly get better at volleyball. So I could easily say homework to, to other things that they would do. But I wouldn't waste any time when I had the net and my kids for the 120 precious minutes that I've got. We're going to hit balls and we're going to hit balls in smaller groups so we get more opportunities to jump and hit. But you coach the little guys and mm -hmm. they need to know how to do that homework. Like don't you ever oh, no. so, yeah, teach I mean, them how to do the plyometrics or anything? And then don't do it anymore in your practices? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just so easy. Kids are such mimes, you know, you say, I mean, I, once you say to a kid, skip, I, maybe there's 10% that, you know, can't skip or something, but the rest of them go, oh, skip, yeah, I know skipping, and they start skipping. So conditioning is homework is really what I'm saying. It does, it, it provides, you know, variety, and especially with younger kids, they need to learn to move, but Training is so specific that one of the discussions, one of my blogs that I wrote in the last six months is about there's no such thing as pri 
primary motor abilities like running and skipping. It's all specific. It's that specific. You know, the fact that I can run doesn't make me a better volleyball player. It's, I gotta run and jump and swing in the volleyball court. So, Anson said conditioning is homework. And finally, the, I'm gonna close with this. Drills and lead up activities, this is Dr. Schmidt, take considerable practice time and do not produce much transfer. Drills don't produce much transfer. So use them sparingly in later practice stages. And it is fruitless to try and train fundamental abilities such as quickness and balance. So concentrate on the skills instead. Quickness in volleyball comes from being quick in volleyball. It doesn't make you a better Seattle Seahawk wide receiver. That comes from being a Seattle Seahawk wide receiver and running your routes and everything is that specific. That's why specificity is so important. Hey, we got time for questions because we're supposed to stop in about five minutes. Questions that have been raised from this so far. Yeah. Yeah, with a younger group, uh, from what I hear you saying, in, uh, most coaches spend 10, 15 minutes uh, at the start of a practice doing warm-up stuff. Yeah. Um, lunges, karaoke yeah. steps, all yeah. high knee kicks, all that good stuff. From what I hear you're saying, you would eliminate that, you mm -hmm. would the butterfly drills. Yeah, stuff. that's a six on six. When they're, the younger they get, the more you play twos. Um, let me prove that point by finding a slide. And I, it's up here pretty quick. It's going to be probably in the next one. There it is. Why is Brazil so good? Okay. What's the coach doing? Having coffee? Player empowered, two on two, not six on six. And to further that point, this is where one American volleyball club has sent us nine Olympians. Nobody else is even close. What do they do? An adult regular court, an adult regular court, but what do you see in the back that maybe is hard to see? There's a little court. <laughs> it's called the baby court and they play two on two on a six meter court. And they watch the big guys and learn from the big guys and they play two on two. And every now and then they get called up because one of the big guys doesn't have a player. And now a little kid's playing with an adult. That's cool too. That's how Karch and Misty got good. But that baby court right there is the reason in no small way that that club has, out of 125 kids, nine Olympians for the U.S. And you're talking beach though, right? Nine in this case, sand, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, but it can be two on two indoors as well. Are you a huge believer in, because uh, I'm a huge believer in my indoor athletes playing beach. Are you a Absolutely. Player? The more opportunities respond in game-like ways, especially the wind and the challenges of outdoor, mm -hmm the better you become an indoor player. My son plays at Princeton, as some of you know. He made All-American this last year. He touches 11-11 now. It's kind of cool to see your genes go high. <laughs> and literally, 501s. <laughs> and in that spirit, he played doubles and fours against adults as he got better. And he played men when he, not age group. If there's something that would really change how fast you get good even though you lose a lot. You stop playing age group competition, you play adults. And this summer, as soon as he gets done, all he's going to do is play doubles. For California where the best doubles is played, he's just going to play doubles until, uh, until he's done. And then it, that's to make him a better indoor player. He's on, he wants to be on the 2020 team. He's not quite good enough yet to be on the 2016 team, so we'll see. But yeah, doubles is, both my kids play doubles all the time. And as a reminder, I was here, I think I told you, but my favorite thing that I'm going to miss this year for the first time in 12 years is playing on Father's Day, which in the United States is June 16th, like the second Sunday in June. 
in the father-daughter, father-son division of the Vail tournament that we created 12 years ago, where 18, 16, 14, and 12-year-olds play with their father against man, boys or girls. It is a one, it's the highlight of my year to play with my own kids um, against other dads that are trying to beat you. Uh, you know, it's, at the 12-year-old level, they're not trying to beat you. They're literally going, here, kid, have a chance. The dads do. They know it. They get it. But as you go up, the 18s, it's like, ah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just had one question for the group. Um, I know that when I worked with elementary camps and things, I used the battle nets. But I was curious, I'm from the island. Down on the beach, do we have any small mini courts for kids as we've seen here? Has anyone run across that in their community? I mean, just some food for thought, I guess. Uh -huh. just to <laughs> well, okay, so let me, I think I can show on the next slide how we do that, or it's close. Yeah, so this is Hawaii. And this is the, one of the things that is on the drill. This is a net that's called four nets on a rope. And because the sand is really expensive, they do a lot of grass, but even when they do sand in Oahu, because, you know, I don't know, a million dollars a square foot in Oahu or whatever, we string it this way on a beach court, and now you've got 32 kids playing doubles because they're playing speedball fours or speedball pairs on this court, and then there's another badminton size court because the nets are 15 feet. So that net goes right down the middle and Boy, I don't know if I show. I mean, that's the same thing we're doing here with ribbon, okay? And so ribbon works just as well, but I'm looking to see if I can find, yeah. So the way we do the courts at the end is just either two by fours or, in this case, Vanuatu, we just went in the jungle and got bamboo, but you know, you go to Lowe's and you get two by fours, and all you do with the X at the end of the court is change the net height by going like that. So this is all on the DVD, you know, in the sections. But that's how you get smaller courts for the kids on a, on a beach court. You just go down the middle and have a lot of small courts. We're past time. <laughs> who's, to, who's next? Is it lunch? You're on. No, it's not lunch. You got another hour to train. <laughs> Thank you.